As I mentioned this morning, I went home last night very, very happy about the meeting we had last night because I saw something I've never seen before, which I desire to discuss with you now in the next 45 minutes or so. Now, what we have before us is a problem, and the problem runs as follows. God does not destroy. To that we all agree, right? And, and therefore he's not the author of any system which, which, which destroys. Satan and sin are the great destroyers. Okay. The sacrificial system involves death, therefore God's going to be the author of it. Does that sound logical? Sure. Sounds logical, right? Therefore Satan must be the author of that system. I saw last night that... Um, the whole question goes much deeper than a simple little piece of apparent logic because uh, God who is not the author of death in any sense of the word whatsoever takes that thing which exists and uses it to destroy itself let's uh, illustrate this by taking a look at the knowledge of good and evil let's go to Genesis the, third, the second chapter first of all Genesis chapter 2, where God gave the command to regard to that tree, and it should be verse uh, 7. No. Verse 16 and 17. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Can you read it? Yes, please. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may eat freely, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you eat of it, you shall die. Thank you. And the course of Genesis chapter 3 points that they did eat of that tree and they did bring death upon themselves. Now, had God planned that they should ever have the knowledge of evil? Never. That was never God's plan. Is God himself the author of the knowledge of evil? No. Once again, Satan and sin are the ones who introduced this uh, terrible curse upon mankind. But uh, once man became involved in the knowledge of evil, then God took that knowledge and actually, and actually reveals that knowledge to us throughout the Word of God so that he might destroy evil itself. Let's take this principle up now by going to... Uh, well, let's take the book Great Controversy for a moment. And in this book we find that uh, throughout the coming eternity we'll be students of the actual history of sin, which of course is the knowledge of evil, which is designed to destroy its power upon us. Uh, page 498 to page 499. Great controversy. We'll start with... We'll start with um, in his dealing with sin on page 498 and read across to the end of the second paragraph on page 499. Someone got it for me, please. What's the paragraph coming? In his dealing with sin. In his dealing with sin, God could employ only righteousness and truth. Satan could not use what God could not, flattery and deceit. He had sought to jump falsify the word of God and had misrepresented his plan of government before the angels, claiming that God was not just in laying laws and rules upon the inhabitants of heaven, that in requiring submission and obedience from his creatures, he was seeking merely the exaltation of himself. Therefore, it must be demonstrated before the inhabitants of heaven as well as of the other worlds that God's government was just, his law perfect. <laughs> Satan had made it appear that he himself was seeking to promote the good of the universe. The true character of the usurper and his real obje object must be understood by all. He must have time to make manifest himself by his wicked works. Continue. Yes, please. The discord which his own course had caused in heaven, Satan charged upon the law and government of God. All evil he declared to be the result of the divine administration. He claimed that it was his own object to improve upon the statutes of Jehovah. Therefore, it was necessary that he could demonstrate the nature of his claims and show the working, of, working out of his proposed changes in the divine law. His own work must condemn him. Satan had claimed from the first that he was not in rebellion. 
the whole universe must see the deceiver unmasked. Can you? Yes, please. Okay. Even when it was decided that he could no longer remain in heaven, infinite wisdom did not destroy Satan, since the service of love alone can alone be acceptable to God. The allegiance of his creatures must rest upon the conviction of his justice and benevolence. The inhabitants of heaven and the, of the other worlds, being unprepared to comprehend the nature or con consequences of sin, could not then have seen the justice and mercy of God in the destruction of Satan. He had been immediately, it, had he been immediately blotted out from existence, they would have served God from fear rather than from love. The influence of the deceiver would not have been fully destroyed, nor would the spirit of rebellion uh, have been utterly eradicated. Evil must be permitted to come to maturity. For the good of the entire universe through ceaseless ages, Satan must more de fully develop his principles that his charges against the divine government might be seen in their true light by all created beings, that the justice and mercy of God and the immutability of his law might forever be placed beyond all question. Satan's rebellion was to be a lesson to the universe through all coming ages, a perpetual testimony to the nature and terrible results of sin. The, the, working, the working out of Satan's rule, its effects upon both men and angels would show that what must be the fruit of setting aside the divine authority. It would testify that with the existence of God's government and his law is bound up the well-being of all creatures he has made. Thus the history of this terrible experiment of rebellion was to be a perpetual safeguard to all holy intelligences to prevent them from being deceived as to the nature of transgression to save them from committing sin and suffering its punishment. <coughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> these, these several paragraphs plainly reveal the fact that um, while God is not the author of knowledge of evil, he will use it in a very powerful and effective way to end the reign of evil. Guess the principle? Let's go back now and pick up one or two of the main points in this reading. Now, God can employ only righteousness and truth now, is the, knowledge, is the knowledge of evil the truth? Yes. It is. It's the truth about evil, right? Okay. A little further down, um, it says that his own works must um, condemn him. I lost track of the statement now, but... Um, where, where is it? The paragraph that starts with a discord, which is on course of cause Right, his own work must condemn him, okay? And when we come to heaven, of course, we're going to spend our time eternal, all eternity, studying the rebellion of Satan, its outworking, its effect upon both, upon both men and angels, until we have a very deep and extensive knowledge of the of evil. Now, will this be a superficial knowledge or very deep and thorough knowledge? Very deep. Very deep and very thorough. Now this raises a certain problem, and it is this, that um, at the present time, Satan also offers a knowledge of evil, does he not? In novels, in uh, picture shows, uh, TV programs, uh, in a thousand different ways he does that. And the entire world, of course, is filled with that knowledge, that they're quite expert in that knowledge. How much good is that knowledge doing them? None. No. It's doing only harm. When we come to God's word and read the knowledge of evil there, the story of David, shall we say, the story of King Saul, the story of Abraham, Adam and Eve's initial sin, Lucifer's defection, the hate leveled against Jesus Christ, and so forth, we read that in a, in a different light altogether from what, what the world reads, reads the events around them. And as we do so, does that have a, a good effect upon us? Yes, if we read it, could be right. Pardon? If we read it, through their eyes, you're saying... No, through God's eyes. Through God's eyes, yes. Right, okay. Now, my point is then that um, the knowledge of evil does not have God for its author, right? Okay. And in and so, of course, it should never have been experienced by the human family. But God takes that knowledge and uses that knowledge to destroy the very source of that knowledge, namely Satan himself, and, the, and, and sin also itself. And when, when we 
uh, thoroughly understand the nature of evil as evil consequence of both men and angels, it will become a perpetual safeguard to all holy intelligences to prevent them from being deceived as the nature of transgression, to save them from committing sin and suffering as punishments. Let's now take this same principle as far as uh, the sacrificial system is concerned because without question God did himself alter the sacrificial system. Now first of all then we'll make this point. Satan is the author of all killing. Would you agree with that? Yeah. All killing. No exceptions whatsoever. No exceptions. None at all. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 18 and take the last verse in the chapter, shall we? <coughs> Revelation chapter 18. The last verse in the chapter. Uh, and in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who have been slain of her on earth. Right. In her, and who is she? <coughs> Babylon, right. Now, who is Babylon? Satan's system. Pardon? Satan's system. Satan's system, right. Not confined to the Catholic Church. Well, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, but to every false religion upon the entire face of the earth. But in other words, Satan's total kingdom, right? Now, in that kingdom is down the blood of prophets and saints and of all who are slain upon the earth. So let's, let's be quite clear then that Satan is the author of all killing which has ever taken place or will take place. God is not guilty of one single killing ever. It would seem then that Satan is the author of the sacrificial system because it involves killing. But there are so many statements in the spirit of prophecy in the Bible that plain that God was the author of that, and we can't, we can't conclude that. On page 107 of Selected Messages, Volume 1, I'll read these words as, as a sample of any more which could be read, or likewise read. Does anybody have it? SM1. Page 107. I like the audience, but this so page. No, no. 107. Every dying victim was a type of Christ. Every dying victim was a type of Christ, which lesson was impressed on mind and heart in the most solemn sacred ceremony and explained definitely by the priests. Sacrifices were explicitly planned by God Himself to teach this great and momentous truth. Through the blood of Christ alone, there is forgiveness of sins. <coughs> Pardon me, the husky today. So, sacrifice, sacrifice, bother. <coughs> Excuse me. So, sacrifices were explicitly planned by God Himself. Who, the, who then planned or ordered the great sacrificial system? God did no question about, it, about that. Now that leads, leads us with a problem that I said a moment ago because it appears that Satan must be the author of that sacrificial system. But when God introduced that system, it came as a great surprise to Satan and it was a great frustration to him too because he realized that his own works were about to condemn him and destroy him as God used his own works to effectively lessen his influence among men and the point forward to a, 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 a dying saviour. Can you read this with me, This little paragraph here, Satan in intense interest. This little paragraph? Yeah. yeah. This is from the Review and Herald. Uh, March 3, 1874. March 3, 1874. Satan, with intense interest, watched every event <coughs> in regards to the sacrificial <coughs> offerings. The devotion and solemnity connected with the shedding of the blood of the victim caused him great uneasiness. This ceremony to him was clothed with mystery, but he was not a dull scholar, and he soon learned that the sacrificial offerings typified some future atonement for man. He saw that these offerings signified repentance for sin. This did not agree with his purposes, and he at once commenced to work upon the heart of Cain to lead him to rebellion against the sacrificial offering which prefigured a redeemer to come. Thank you very much. <coughs> now, I'm just sticking your voice a bit better than that. <coughs> now, when Satan introduced 
wish into the universe and into this earth in particular, what do they hope to achieve? The total destruction of God's kingdom, right? Yes. Maybe where are they? I can't you one of those before at the same time, probably going to try. I'm too rich at lunch, I think. <coughs> Thank you. And they look pretty, pretty uh, tight. Yeah, you just take one, Fred. Take the one. Okay, that's all right. Well wrapped as usual. is uh, March 3, 1874. My point is this, that... Uh, um, well, my point was that Satan hoped that by causing man to sin, he would be able to destroy God's created works and uh, wipe out the human family altogether. Thank you very much. And successfully destroy the entire universe. Because he knew that sin would lead to death, that was for certain. But to his amazement and, and, and chagrin and disappointment, God took the very thing he had to use and, and turned it into an instrument against him, namely, namely the, the, the killing aspect. And as Satan saw God unfolding to have an Eve the plan of salvation, he was filled with apprehension and amazement and surprise that God could do such a thing. So that God took something which already was, come back to the knowledge of evil, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, they then acquired their first knowledge of evil, and God took that which was already there, something, something that Satan himself had made, and used that to destroy what Satan had made, a very masterful action upon God's part, a, a marvelous piece of work. And likewise, in the sacrificial system, God took killing which already existed. He didn't, he didn't start it, didn't do it, right? And he used that then to destroy Satan's kingdom and Satan's power, as is evidenced by the study of the uh, sacrificial system itself, which we'll look at in just a moment. Let's take the main points here again. Um, the devotion and solemnity connected with the sin of the, the victim causing great uneasiness. This certainly will tell him his club of mystery is not a dull scholar. He soon learned the sacrificial offerings to advise some future atonement for man. I think I'm sure the other guy's voice was pretty bad today, though. I can't talk in such a the same fellow, for sure. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Now, Satan was caught by surprise by the sacrificial system. Did he, did, did he then make it or create it or author it? No. Impossible. He was Absolutely surprised. impossible. He was now, I think Lindy, you have a statement from, from uh, <coughs> Joy Redemption, I mean, Joy of Redemption, page 273. Yeah. This is talking about Paul. No, about, had, about the sacrificial system. Right. Okay. He had regarded Jesus as making of none effect the law of God. When his spiritual vision was touched by the finger of God, he learned that Christ was the originator of the entire Jewish system of sacrifices. Thank you very much. So who was the originator? Christ. 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 Now can you go beyond the originator? That's the starting point, right? So before Christ originated, there was no such thing in existence at all. Christ started it, and Christ, of course, in the sense will finish it in the end. Let's go to the chapter in um, Patriarchs and Prophets dealing with the announcement to Adam and Eve of the plan of salvation. We ask ourselves a very simple question. Could Satan have been the one who brought this great blessing to mankind? I say not. Rather, I say again that God took the killing which already existed and used that to destroy the killing which already existed. In Patriarchs, but when we come to page uh, 70, I believe. Uh, quite. Uh, 
page 68. And we want the paragraph of the sacrificial offering ordained by God to be, to be demanded for better reminder, etc. The sacrificial offerings were ordained by God to be to man a perpetual reminder and a per penitential acknowledgement of his sin and a confession of his faith in the promised Redeemer. They were intended to impress upon the fallen race the solemn truth that it was sin that caused death. To Adam, the offering of the first sacrifice was a most painful ceremony. His hand must be raised to take life, which only God could give. It was the first time he had ever witnessed death, and he knew that it had been, a, had he been obedient to God, there would have been no death of man or beast. As he slew the innocent victim, he trembled at the thought that his sin must shed the blood of the spotless Lamb of God. This scene gave him a deeper and more vivid sense of the greatness of his transgression, which nothing but the death of God's dear Son could expiate. As he marveled at the infinite goodness that would give such a ransom to save the guilty, a star of hope illuminated the dark and terrible future and relieved it of its utter desolation. Let's come back now to some of the main points of this paragraph. It says the sacrificial offerings were ordained by God. That's clear, isn't it? Plain, simple, straightforward statement. To be demanded a perpetual reminder and a penitential acknowledgement of his sin and the confession of faith in the promised Redeemer. That was their purpose, that was their, that was their intent, that was the reason for their design to be a perpetual reminder and a penitential acknowledgement of, of their sin and the confession of his faith in the promised Redeemer. Could you imagine, even begin to imagine Satan uh, ordaining or authoring a system which would produce those results? Of course not. Satan desired the, ex the exact opposite from that. He desired them not to be pen penitent toward their sin but to be blatant in those sins. They were intended to impress upon the fallen race the solemn truth that it was sin that caused death. Does Satan argue that way? Well, what's his argument? Sin all you like and live forever. That's his argument. God's argument is sin causes death. To Adam, the offering of the first sacrifice was the most painful ceremony. Now, let me stress the point that when Adam raised the knife to stay the first victim, he did not then become a killer. Did he? Okay, so point. When Adam stood the first sacrifice, he did not then become a killer. What was he already? Right, when, 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 when did he become that? At the point of sin, in back in the Garden of Eden. And God <clears throat> simply required Adam to do what he already was, to reveal what he himself was at that point of time, and by so doing, to cause him to recognize the fact that sin causes death, and to be led to turn away from the penitential uh, uh, confession of sin. And before I go any further, I'd like to make a strong point, and that is this, that uh, we are dealing now with a sacrificial system as God ordained, not as it was later perverted by apostate Israel. As you remember, they certainly turned it into a works program and used it to cover up their iniquity and their sin rather than to expiate their, expiate their sins. We're dealing here with, with that system as God ordained, which of course is a different thing altogether. Now a little further down, um, as he slew the innocent victim, he trembled at the thought that he sin must shed the blood of the spotless Lamb of God. <clears throat> so, again I ask the question, would Satan seek to teach the thought that our sin must shed the blood of the spotless Son of God? No way. Um, the scene gave me more, a deep and more vivid sense of, his, of the greatness of his transgression. So he saw the greatness of his transgression he never seen it before because of the sacrificial offering that day. Again, is that Satan's objective? And finally, <clears throat> he 
marveled at the infinite goodness that gives such a ransom to save the guilty. He marveled at that. He saw the goodness of God and therefore it led to what? To repentance. A star of hope will live in the dark and terrible future and it leads to its utter desolation. Now come back to the garden for a moment and let's ask ourselves what God might have done or what would never have worked. God could have said to his first created being, he said, okay, you've both made a bad mistake, you've broken my commandments, I'll just forgive you, but I'll just forgive you for that and you just carry on. Could God have done that? He certainly could have done just that. It would not have worked, of course, because then some angel would have said, well, you forgave them, you can forgive me, and the thing would have snowballed to immense proportions. I think um, one point there that obviously somehow that God had to show that sin caused death because because they didn't see that clearly they would have sinned again, you see. Quite right. Um, so somehow he had to bring to their mind what caused death. And that was right. This was obviously the only avenue that could choose. Right, right. And by calling upon man to stay the victim of God, did not himself become a killer because man already was the killer. Already. God, God didn't become a killer at all. So in the Garden of Eden, God could have said to Adam and Eve, okay, I'll forgive you this time, just don't let it happen again and wipe the slate clean for a fresh start. But that would have caused uh, a, an ongoing extension of that sin as other folk decided they could sin to with impunity. And that, that can't be done. So God then took sin as hell, or the killing that sin brought about, and use it, use it to destroy sin in turn. Let me impress upon your mind that this paragraph says then that um, on page 68, the sacrificial offerings were ordained by God to be to man a perpetual reminder and a perpetual reminder of his sin and so on. Let's come across now to um, Abraham and the call of God to sacrifice his son upon the mountain. Page, it starts on page 145 of the book Page <coughs> That deals first of all with the mistakes made in, in uh, marrying Hagar and the birth of Ishmael, and goes on to talk about uh, the birth of Isaac and the joy that brought to the father after so long a time. And uh, on page 147, it begins to deal with the great sacrifice he's called upon to make at this time. If you have the book, please read, God had called Abraham to be the father of the faith in the paragraph. God had called Abraham to be the father of the faithful, and his life is to stand as an example of faith to succeeding generations. But his faith had not been perfect. He had shown distrust of God in concealing the fact that Sarah was his wife, and again in his marriage with Hagar. That he might reach the highest standard, God subjected him to another test, the closest which man was ever called to endure. In a vision of the night, he was directed to repair to the land of Moriah, and there offer up his son as a burnt offering upon a mountain that should be shown him. At the time of receiving this command, Abraham had reached the age of 120 years. He was regarded as an old man, even in his generation. In his earlier years, he had been strong to endure hardship and to break in danger, but now the ardor of his youth had passed away. One in the vigor of manhood made with courage meet difficulties and afflictions that would cause his heart to fail later in life, when his feet are faltering toward the grave. But God had reserved his last, most trying task for Abraham until the burden of years was heavy upon him and he longed for rest from anxiety and toil. Thank you very much. Now, God had called Abraham to a very special position to be the father of the faithful, but he failed badly in two, two previous occasions, which were what? Remember what it said? Hagar and Mahalia, Sarah, his sister. That's right. The Egyptian experience and the experience with Hagar when he went to her and they had the child called Ishmael. Now this is described as not being perfect faith. I'd like to uh, move that point for a moment. Let's go across briefly to, the, to uh, page 153. Uh, no, page 
page 155. And uh, we're starting on the bottom page 154 because Abraham, Abraham has shown a lack of faith in God's promises. I've got that, please. Because Abraham had shown a lack of faith in God's promises, Satan had accused him before the angels and before God of having failed to comply with the conditions of the covenant and as unworthy of its blessings. God desired to prove the loyalty of his servant before all heaven to demonstrate that nothing less than perfect obedience can be accepted and to open more fully before them the plan of salvation. That's a sufficient moment. Thank you very much. Now, the last point uh, referred to here is this, that nothing, or to demonstrate that nothing less than perfect obedience can be accepted. Now, in the case of Abraham, did he, did he keep the Sabbath perfectly? Did he? Well, first we know, uh, we can't be sure every last of the detail, of course, but uh, he was a faithful Sabbath keeper. Was he not a worshipper? No. A health reformer? I would say definitely yes. Uh, he pays faithful time to not go today? Yes. And in day to day living, no doubt he had been a, been a very obedient person in respect to God's commandments. Did he pay some, some sort? Yes. <laughs> uh, so, in what respect had he been imperfect? His faith. His faith, right, which led him to violate the Sabbath rest principles. Now, in respect to the birth of Ishmael, God had promised him a child, a son who would be the son of promise. But the years rolled by, 25 more together, I think, and during that period of time, no son actually appeared. And they began to get anxious because they saw themselves passing beyond the childbearing period of their lives. And they began to fear that God's promise was not going to be fulfilled unless they did something about it. So they then set about carrying out God's will their own way, employing the powers of their command, which were physical, of course. Now let's, let's uh, not overlook the fact that from our point of view, of course, it's all very obvious and even blatant looking, but from his point of view, it was a very uh, commendable course of action. After all said and done, about whose kingdom was he concerned? God's kingdom. About what plan was he concerned? Plan of salvation. And the future interest of God's cause was his major concern and the motivation for his doing what he did. And did, did Abraham have a high sense of response or concern for God's kingdom in the future? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the stronger that concern, of course, the greater, greater was the pressure upon him to do something to save a bad looking, looking situation. But, 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 but what ought he to have done? Rest, rest in God. I rest in God and let, let him work it out in his own time and way. It's pretty deadly. <laughs> <laughs> now, who later made the same mistake? Very shortly later, too. Jacob, when he stole his brother's birthright by deception and fraud and later, later again another great man of God in those early days I'm thinking of uh, Moses let's turn briefly to page 201 in the book Patriarchs and Prophets <coughs> and no, I thought it was just there but uh here somewhere it tells us that, um, yes, yeah, page 197, 198. This is the error of Jacob. Start on the, the last three lines, bottom of the page, the error which had led to Jacob's sin. Page 197. The error that had led to Jacob's sin in obtaining the birthright by fraud was now clearly set before him. He had not trusted God's promises, but had sought by his own efforts to bring about that which God would have accomplished in his own time and way. As an evidence that he had been forgiven, his name was changed from one that was a reminder of his sin to one that comm commemorated his victory. <coughs> Thy name, said the angel, shall be called no more Jacob, the supplanter, but Israel, 
for as a prince has thou power with God and with men, and has prevailed. Thank you very much. Now, was Jacob's sin a reproduction of, of Abraham's sin? Yes. Absolutely. Now, in the case of Moses, we find the same, the same situation. On page 248 and page 249, but we looked at this last year, so I'll read it again today. But Moses likewise sought to deliver Israel by slaying the Egyptian, uh, by, by, by being the plant maker and the problem solver, but of course all to no avail. So, so because he was the father of the faithful, Abraham had to demonstrate before the universe his, his deliverance from that unfaithfulness of the past. And for this reason, God uh, directed him to take his beloved son Isaac and offer him as a sacrifice upon Mount Moriah. Now, there can be no doubt about the person who did give this command. It was God, not Satan. In fact, Satan did his best to stop God's command from being carried out. Let's, uh, well, first of all, note some points on page 147, the paragraph just read, which says that uh, God reserved his last most trying test for Abraham until the burden of years was heavily upon him. But God had reserved his last most trying test. Which God is this? The true God? What is the God of this world? Yes, I mean, the God of Satan, in other words. It's obviously God. Now, uh, coming across to page 148, uh, we'll read the two paragraphs in the obedience of faith that sets it down to impossibility. 148. In the obedience of faith, Abraham had forsaken his native country had turned away from the graves of his fathers and the home of his kindred. He had wandered as a stranger in the land of his inheritance. He had waited long for the birth of the promised heir. At the command of God, he had sent away his son Ishmael. And now, when the child so long desired was entering upon manhood, and the patriarch seemed able to discern the... What's that? Of his hopes, a trial greater than all others was before him. The command was expressed in words that must have wrung with anguish that father's heart. Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and offer him there for a burnt offering. Isaac was the light of his home, the solace of his old age, above all else, the inheritor of the promised blessing. The loss of such a son by accident or disease would have been heartbreaking to the fond father. It would have bowed down his whitened head with grief, but he was commanded to shed the blood of that son with his own hand. It seemed to him a fearful impossibility. Thank you. Now, to Ab as far as Abraham is concerned, who gave him this command? God or Satan? Right. He was quite clear about that. And so we, we can likewise be clear too. Now, Abraham was a man who walked very closely with God and received messages direct from God, was a man that did not serve Satan, excepting in his lack of faith on those two occasions. Did, did he then have um, the, the capacity to recognize God's voice? Yes. Yeah. No, definitely. Now, let's see what Satan's role in this whole thing was, because Satan obviously was very, very interested in this thing and desired to further break the faith of Abraham and maintain an iniquity and he was also very anxious that he should not confess his sin and come back into harmony with God. So what was Satan's role? Next paragraph please. Satan was at hand to suggest that he must be deceived for the divine law commands thou shalt not kill and God would not require what he had once forbidden. Thank you, that's enough for the moment. Or Satan's argument to Abraham? You must be deceived because God says, Thou shalt not kill, and God wouldn't give such a command. That's clear. So we have God's role in the whole picture. We also have Satan's role also made very clear in this in this in this in this, in this case. Now what uh, was Satan carefully and deliberately overlooking at this time in regard to killing? The similar principle I announced earlier in the study period, namely that when killing already existed, 
and was destroying the human family because of its sin, God took that existing thing and turned it into a means of destroying the existing thing. Right? In other words, the sacrificial, the sacrificial system was an application of killing already going on designed to prevent the killing from going on eternally. And Satan, of course, overlooked that point quite completely and naturally. He wouldn't acquiesce to that point. That's the last thing he wanted want Abraham to see at all. Now, the rest of this paragraph reinforces our conclusion. Let's read it now, shall we? Going outside his tent. Going outside his tent, Abraham <coughs> looked up to the clean, calm brightness of the unclouded heaven and recalled the promise made nearly 50 years before that his seed should be innumerable as the stars. If this promise was to be fulfilled through Isaac, how could he be put to death? Abraham was tempted to believe that he might be under a delusion. In his doubt and anguish, he bowed upon the earth and prayed as he had never prayed before for some confirmation of the command that he must perform this terrible duty. He remembered the angel sent to reveal to him God's purpose to destroy Sodom and who bore to him the promise of this same son Isaac. And he went to the place where he had several times met the heavenly messengers, hoping to meet them again and receive some further direction. But none came to his relief. Darkness seemed to shut him in, but the command of God was sounding in his ears. Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. That command must be obeyed, and he dared not delay. Day was approaching, and he must be on his journey. Thank you. That's not the moment. Now, that command must be obeyed. What command? Take now thy son, thy only son, and offer him as an offering, whom thou lovest, and offer him for an offering. Now, if the command came from Satan, what then? It must not be obeyed. If it must, but if it must be obeyed, who did it come from? Obviously from God. And so Abraham understood that and dared not disobey. After all, he was a very obedient uh, child of God as a rule, and therefore he did obey the command of God and took his son to this sacrificial point. My time has gone to the study, but I'm sorry, the clock has run out, so I'll stop there for this time, for the time being. Any questions you'd like to ask or observations you'd like to make before we go any further? Yes, Robert. Uh, I have a question on um, the theory that uh, Adam was a killer. And because he was already a killer, God took that attitude or spirit and then told him, you need to kill some more in order to get rid of the sin. Now in Romans 12 verse 21 it says, uh, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So God overcomes evil with good. It would seem to me, if I see someone as a killer, that I try to stop him from killing more. But I understand the way you prevent is, well Adam, you're a killer, and now I want you to kill a little bit more. And that doesn't, it seems like overcoming evil was evil. And not overcoming evil was good. Okay, good point. Yeah. Uh, to what Wilfred is saying, in the whole study of, of the sacrifice, especially of Abraham and his son, we, I see that as a beautiful illustration of showing the goodness of God. Because God the Father, who now the law had been broken, sent his son to become a man and knew that the very law would destroy his son. Because the, the, the power of sin is the law. Sure. So in a sense, God was sending his son to die, and the very law that emanated from God would now take its toll upon the son. It was, it was showing the goodness of the father to such an extent that it's the goodness of God that's being illustrated in here. And so even though he didn't, he, had, he showed it in this system, that's where our eyes should be. It's the goodness of God each time. Not necessarily in the killing of the lamb, because then we're losing the whole picture. It's in the dying of the son, the goodness of God, that the father let the son die by his own law, which would now take the life. He will believe the sacrifice point forward to Christ's death and us. Go ahead and come into Wilfred's point that I made a moment ago. Um, it is true that we have a 
from evil with good, right? But at the same time, the knowledge of evil which is not good is used by God to overcome evil. For this reason, the premise of the study of the knowledge of evil will go on throughout through all eternity. It'll be a safeguard to the whole human family. And I don't see this killing more because uh, when when Adam sinned back in the Garden of Eden, he became a destroyer through and through. His whole nature became a destroyer, a killer. So when he came out of the Garden, God said, take a lamb and sacrifice. It wasn't more killing. It was simply a, an expression of what he already was or what was going, going all the time. The fact that he wasn't actually personally killing in a sacrifice every minute of the day uh, doesn't mean he's not a killer every minute of the day. He was. My yeah. follow-up question? Yeah, sure. Um, if... If Adam saw all these beautiful things that we read in Patriarchs and Prophets on page 68, yeah. wouldn't have been then one lamb, wouldn't that have been enough? I mean, if I see the beauty of Christ's character that he's a Messiah by killing this lamb and we just read how it hurt him, mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't it be logical to assume then, then well, one killing is enough? Why? So why does he continue killing? Because he vowed to see what he should have seen the first time. And the fact of history is that they saw less and less. Yes, but not. That is true. That is, of course, that uh, the perversion of, of the sacrificial system came about because of the apostasy, which is one of the sad, sad chapters of the whole history of the past. It was not to be that way. So then he already apostatized after the first lamb because apparently he didn't see what he was supposed to see. Now we're, we're talking about when they, when they multiply sacrifices. Now, God will die, there should be a daily sacrifice in the morning and the evening, and a daily bird offering, and a daily, instead of an apostate. Right. Right. But, but, but when they did lose their trial, and they did this, they died many times. Verse 4, it says, uh, just shall live by faith. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say the just shall live by a faith plus an animal sacrifice. Can you explain that? Sure. Uh, I can't really <coughs> pinpoint a word right now, but I've read it, which is why it says that, that uh, it was an act of faith upon their part that they would have to sacrifice their lives Uh, on page 68, talking about the sacrificial offering, it was a confession.